Well, hi, everyone. So there I was in my fourth grade gym class, square dancing. <laughs> Not because I wanted to, but because, you know, it was that time of year for fourth graders, and we had to do it with girls. But, you know, I was, I was goofing around, you know, what do fourth grade boys do anyways? When suddenly my gym teacher came up behind me and smacked me to the floor. Newton, stop goofing around. Well, that was my first encounter with our broken judicial system and how I'm going to be kicking off today's look at making peace in our quarrelsome culture. Again, I want to welcome you. If we haven't met yet, I'm Doug Newton, a pastor for 45 years, a national award-winning magazine editor and author of 24 books, and this is At the Intersection with Doug Newton, where scripture, culture, and character meet. Now, I'm here to help you pursue the kind of character needed to align with Scripture faithfully and to engage culture graciously. So each week we make one observation about our culture, we give one insight from the Bible that speaks to that issue, and we suggest one way to strengthen the character that you and I need to relate to our mixed-up world with exemplary grace. Now, as I say every week, and this is important, this is a no-gripe zone. Our question is not, oh, what's wrong with our culture? It's about, hey, what's the right way to respond? So, you ready? Here we go. In the introduction, I told you of my fourth grade gym teacher accosting me for goofing around during square dancing in gym class. <laughs> But I, I wasn't actually goofing around because of the girls. It was because I grew up in a religiously conservative home that did not approve of dancing. <laughs> so I figured in my little fourth grade mind, if I didn't take it seriously, God wouldn't be upset with me for sinning. <laughs> but as I said, Mr. Mercer you know, cuffed me across the back of my head, and boy, <laughs> you know, if he did that today, goodbye, Mr. Mercer. Hello, million-dollar lawsuit. Yeah, what Mr. Mercer did was not only inappropriate, but it was uncalled for. It was unfair, right? It's like a lot of issues of justice being argued about in our, our culture today. You know, prison reform, no cash bail, uh, the alleged weaponization of the Justice Department. I mean, there's debates, there's mistrust, there's anger, there's accusations, and all swirling with, with tornadic effects tearing us apart. I mean, law is being written or interpreted and cherry-picked as a tool to gain or to retain power these days rather than to protect people, to protect property and rights and privileges for the common good. And so the conflicts are raging. So what do we do? I mean, some people would have us dismantle the judicial system and, and rebuild a new one that's more fair and equitable in their eyes. Could we perhaps instead simply rediscover, re-educate ourselves, and recommit to the wisdom of the judicial system that we have? I, I, when I, that's what I think. I think we should just recommit to our traditional jurisprudence, which, which is the philosophy of law and the practices of law within a culture. And a, a American jurisprudence is built on the rule of law. I mean, that's the heart of everything. The laws are in charge, not a particular person, capricious, arbitrary, dict dictatorial, or a handful of, of powerful people. The laws are in charge of everything, right? But the laws are largely built on values and, and moral virtues derived from the Judeo-Christian influence. And so this is ironic, it's ironic that those who attack Judeo-Christian ethic seem unappreciative of the fact that the religious worldview that they attack has promoted the very freedoms that allow them to attack it. <laughs> we are in many respects the amazing nation we are precisely because we are founded on the Judeo-Christian moral worldview. I understand why others may have negative feelings, though, due to the many ways in which Religious people in general and Christians in particular have abused power in violation of the very principles of justice that we espouse. And so that hypocrisy has created some of the cracks in the foundation of our judicial system. 
But again, we need to ask, what can be done with all this turmoil and conflict in our culture? What can we do? But it really comes down to each of us asking ourselves, you know, what can I do? I mean, we can't, as individuals, effect much change at a global level or even a national or state level, but we can recommit to the basic justice principles at a personal and local level. I mean, certainly, that would in itself, it seems to me, reduce the amount of animosity and discord in all venues of our culture, not just the judicial judicial system. So what are those justice principles? Well, do we really have to ask? (laughs) I mean, if you grew up with a TV in your house, then you've been watching those basic principles in action on, on numerous courtroom dramas dating all the way back to Perry Mason in the 60s, uh, to more than 20 years of the series Law and Order, and and even movies like A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson made back in 1992. That's why I say we really have been well-educated in this whole matter of our justice system, particularly in the courtroom setting. Now, let me prove it to you. We know uh, that in a court of law, where the prosecution is attempting to prove guilt and the defense is trying to prove innocence or at least create reasonable reasonable doubt, there are certain basic requirements that um, uh, witness that that have to be met in the courtroom. There is uh, the necessity for multiple witnesses. There is uh, a rejection of hearsay. And then also the requirement for a rejection of unsupported suspicion and of, uh, of a person's motives and so forth. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But suppose along with me this particular uh, scenario. Suppose you're a defendant in a trial accused of burglary and you're a 20-year-old pool boy who works in that neighborhood and, and you drive a 2014 white Honda Civic. And and so why you? Why did the police come back? Well, the police have photos of a 2014 white Honda Civic parked in front of the burgled house and a witness who described a person of your race, height, and build getting out of that car and heading into the back, around the back of the house. Now, you didn't commit the crime, but you became a person of interest and police started investigating you according to to means, motive, and opportunity. So opportunity. Because of your job, you were around the neighborhood a lot, and you could always tell when people might be away on a trip. Opportunity. Means, well, in your line of work, you had the means, as in the knowledge of security systems and location cameras, because you're often given access to people's homes to you know pick up equipment and so forth. So you had the means. Well, what about motive? Well, the police recently uh, discovered through their investigation that you recently made some unusually large purchases for a young person making pool boys wages. (laughs) How'd you get the money for the 70-inch flat screen TV that you bought two weeks ago? You see, that made them suspicious uh, of that motive for stealing. And so the trial begins. Now, if that's all the prosecution has, what is the defense going to do? You know, you've watched TV. First of all, they're going to demand additional witnesses. One witness is not enough in this case or most cases. But then they're going to point out, you know, the police, you can't, you can't uh, suspect my client's motive just because he's young and financially strapped. That, that's, that's way too much assumption. So the prosecution, knowing that they need more evidence, calls a witness to the stand, who says they overheard your friends wondering how you could afford a new TV. They just said, he can't afford a great big TV like that, $2,000. But your defense attorney immediately uh, objects, hearsay, your honor. And he's right. That's hearsay. What's hearsay? Hearsay is any evidence introduced in court by a witness on the stand or legal counsel who's testifying to something they heard someone else say who was not in court at the time they made the statement. You see, in court, only statements made under oath 
are admissible as evidence. And so the judge sustains the objection and the statement is stricken from the record. Does that all sound fair? I mean, we've watched this you know, for years, right? Well, uh, I mean, we could have been making those uh, objections ourselves, but here's the point I want you to remember. These three principles about witnesses, hearsay, and motives, as well as many others, flow from one inviolable standard every witness has to meet at the very beginning of their testimony. They have to give an oath by answering this question in the affirmative and swear to it. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You see, all the proceedings in a court of law serve that one requirement and ultimate goals, finding the truth, maintaining an unbiased and an unfailing quest for truth in order to do justice. You see, without truth, justice cannot be served, whether regarding criminal justice, social justice, or basic fairness in human interactions. Justice cannot occur without an unbiased, unfailing quest for truth. That means the same principles regarding witnesses, you know, hearsay and motives and so forth, apply in everyday life, not just in the courtroom. We have to insist on there being multiple witnesses before you and I accept anything as fact and render any judgment from what we've heard. Secondly, regarding hearsay, we must reject as hearsay any time we're tempted to make any judgments or draw any conclusions about some person C based on what person A told us that person B said about person C. And I need to say that again. We don't draw any conclusions about the motives of anybody based on what, what uh, person C has told us that person A said that person B told them. I mean, because you're not there when person B is making that statement. You're not there to question them. You're not saying, now, is this the truth? How do you know this? You know, why do you say this? And so similarly, we must not suspect or judge anyone's modus, motive unless that person himself tells you what was going on inside his head. I mean, in rare situations, there may be uh, a no other possible explanation for that particular motive. But in most cases, unless you've heard from the person what their reason is, what they, why they did what they did, you don't, you don't take that to the bank. These are the standards of American jurisprudence. Prudence, which should carry over into our lives, not just be present in the courtrooms. But the trick is this. <laughs> we're on our own to watch our own conduct because we're not in a courtroom, are we? I mean, there's, there's just no one around to object when we or others around us violate those principles, which means we really need to start every day as if we're actually placing our hands on the Bible and promising to tell the truth the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. And not only should that be our standard when we tell something, when we tell what we say is the truth, but when we seek it as well, that we would seek the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, you know the ninth commandment, right, of God's moral laws. What is it? Thou shalt bear, not bear false witness, right? In other words, we understand what that means. That means that you uh, are not supposed to tell lies. But it also means that we must not put up with falsehoods or be party to anything that is not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that is super hard because all around us there are false witnesses. I mean, Biased news organizations, social media voyeurs, video bloggers, they, they point their cameras, they present their video clips and their sound bites, and, and they fool us into thinking that these digital factual snippets actually present truth. But what about the sound bite they left out or 
What about uh, what happened just before or just after the camera captured that five second video? The sound bite and video clips, while they are in a very uh, superficial sense, facts and true because of that, do not tell the truth, not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We have to dig for the truth, right? We're also surrounded every day by people who have a cause or a mission or an ax to grind or a personal vendetta or a vested interest behind the things they say. And, you know, people with an agenda are notorious for limiting information uh, that's put out or sharing anecdotes that fit their case or manipulate statistics that support their point of view. And not only are we prey for their partial truths and misapplied facts, but you know, when it serves our purposes, we're often accomplices when those kind of biases support um, and, so, and the sources that we appeal to support something that we want others to accept as true and right. And then there's the persuasive or the pervasive habit of, of suspecting someone's bad intentions, of impugning their motives without knowledge or evidence. I mean, you know, seriously, this is a pandemic way more destructive than COVID-19. You watch any news broadcast, you can hardly count the number of times the reporter or a, a news anchor will slip in a statement about a person's motive as if it's a fact. This just in, a top White House official says the president, that President Biden just vetoed the appropriations bill. And then the news anchor goes on to say, this really comes as no surprise because the president has to placate his political base. Really? That's why? Uh, he couldn't have had any other reason for vetoing the bill? You, you know that for sure, do you? You see, he just stated the motive as fact without corroboration. These violations of truth and justice are, are not only uh, incessant, but they're also insidious. In fact, if you track any point of destructive conflict back to its Big Bang, <laughs> I think you're likely going to find one of these violations. Our hope for a better world occurs when enough people refuse to bear false witness, whether through speaking, accepting, or just putting up with partial truth masquerading as the whole truth. Peacemaking begins by recommitting to the basics of jurisprudence and truth. So I'd like to suggest that this would be kind of like a mantra in every moment, every day, every venue of your life, whether casual conversation, uh, political commitments and research, religious beliefs, before you speak or accept any declarative statement as accurate, you ask yourself this question like a mantra. Do I know this to be true to the best of my ability? And then I would suggest that, that we each would begin every day with the oath every courtroom witness must make. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. If you live by that standard, you're going to be more than just a good trial witness. You're going to be a godly character witness. So I've got another uh, crosswalk for you. Uh, I, I, here we are, over here. <laughs> that I'd love to have you download, to use this week, that show steps that we can take to inject this passion for truth back into our daily walk. Uh, below on the screen, you see the link to get that, Crosswalk Episode 5. I'm really uh, thankful for the many people that uh, have been downloading these and telling me that they're actually using them. It, some of them take a lot of work. I'm not going to go through, uh, through it all, take any time to go through it all, but let me give you just a quick overview. Uh, it gives you a, a, an exercise on a daily commitment prayer that you can pray beginning every day. Then I give you a challenge to open yourself to a change in attitude or opinion on some hot-button issue that you already have an opinion about, but to be open to changing it, adjusting it by seeking out and exposing yourself to the best arguments of another point of view. 
And then, really, the thing I'm most excited about in this particular crosswalk is a fun scavenger hunt that I'm giving you for looking for these three violations of truth and justice. You know, having enough witnesses, no hearsay, no impugning motives. And and it's going to give you an opportunity just to be looking around and and seeing how many that you can check off or over the course of five to seven days. And I, I hope you'll download this very helpful guide. Now, I'm glad to see so many of you listening to the podcast and that you've uh, downloaded this character development tool each week. But also, I, I would appreciate uh, if you would just share this podcast with other people that you know. If you know, if you appreciate it and you know some other people might benefit from it, I know that there are people right now who are considering using a series of them for small groups in a church. I am really pleased to hear that. And remember, you can also go to the, my Fresh Impact YouTube channel and direct people there for an edited version of each podcast. And also, if you check out the information about the audio-only version, because some people want to listen to that information and this podcast on the go. All of the information about this podcast and and uh, the, the ones that I've done in already and the ones that are coming up in the future can be found on the website. The links are all going to be right at the end of this stream. So, anyways, I just want to... Thank you for uh, tuning in. It really uh, honors me that you'd be listening. I, I'd love to hear from you. Send me your thoughts about what you might like uh, me to address in the future. Uh, and by the way, I am already looking forward to not just next week, but several weeks. I'm just anxious to get to the ones that I've already begun to work on. But next week, it's self-esteem and flying and the flying ashtray. So I hope to see you there. Stay true.